my few moments of introduction. Okay, we are recording. Okay, perfect. So uh, good afternoon, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, 65th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Uh, this is the, uh, what are we at here, the 10th meeting of our uh, sixth year of uh, operation. And uh, we are recording this meeting as we always do. And uh, if you don't wish to be recorded, now is your opportunity to, uh, to leave. Um, we are delighted to have with us uh, a long-standing member of the group uh, this month, uh, Randy Saad, who is the Executive Director of uh, the Refocus uh, Project Program. And uh, Randy, I will uh, turn it over to you. Uh, for everybody who's joined, I'm updating the uh, meeting minutes with who's here uh, in the wiki page uh, that uh, the URL is in the chat. And uh, we'll keep that up to date as people join um, during the meeting if, if hopefully some other people will show up as well. So Randy, over to you and uh, excited to uh, hear all the updates on Refocus. So quick question for you, Anthony, given that uh, we have the group of us that are here. Can yeah. I modify my presentation at all to cater to the group, or are we thinking of this more uh, as a resource that will be recorded and available to everybody, so it should be the way that it was? I, I, I think we should present as, as uh, for the purposes of the larger group. So in, include whatever information you need. And I, as we've discussed, Randy, you know, we all learn things about how everybody's learning by how we talk about things. So I'm sure you've got some new ways to introduce things. Uh, and uh, certainly Henrietta has not heard the story before, so uh, I, I suggest you start off uh, as you were planning. Sounds very good. Thanks so much for having me, Anthony, and thanks to everybody for listening in. Um, I guess this is maybe now my third or fourth time presenting as part of the group. Um, it's pretty interesting to reflect back on sort of how things have evolved over the last three or four years. I'm excited to sort of be at the interval we are, and I'm excited to update the group as well. Um, I recognize most of you have heard me introduce or train on refocus several times. Um, so I've tried to balance in my presentation providing a bit of the 411 on refocus with talking a lot about our progress as well as sharing insights from the perspective of us being a burgeoning project of this group. Um, Randy, sorry to interrupt. Um, what's been recorded, what's been broadcast is the speakers view in PowerPoint, not the slides. Uh, so you need to um, make sure that what's being broadcast is the slides, not the speaker's view. Okay, we, we do not see. So what I'm seeing, uh, what I'm seeing is the PowerPoint speaker's pres presenter's view. So I see your first slide and I see the, the next slide as well visible on my screen. Oh, I see. It's on the left side is what they're seeing. Right. So they're seeing that as well. Recorded. Yeah. So when, when, you, when you choose share screen, you need to tell it, uh, maybe um, swap displays is the fastest way of doing it since you don't have other people in the room. Excellent. There we go. Uh, yes. Now hit, now hit, uh, Full screen again. The presenter view, see if that works. Yes, that's working. Nicely done, Ramesh. Thank you. I've got in room coaching, I've got remote coaching. I'm going to win. I'm winning. Winning. <laughs> Perfect. So we'll dive in. Um, I'll, I'll start with just a little, a little intro about myself. Uh, so for what it's worth, I, I started my career and continued since the beginning uh, working as a management consultant. Uh, originally, I started with a, a multinational consultancy focused on IT transformation projects. Um, I later spent several years working within the corporate sustainability space, um, both with boutique firms and on my own for the last 10 years as an independent. Um, and I was particularly surprised by the inefficacy of sort of the, the internal corporate sustainability programs that I observed, as well as um, the NGOs that help practitioners build capacity and the available educational solutions that are out there to support the kind of work that we're trying to do within organizations. In most cases, I don't think organizations 
and the practitioners leading sustainability programs are even solving the right problem. And um, based on my experiences, refocus became a response to the gap that I could see, combining um, my past experience developing programs designed to support transformational change with leading expertise, expertise that I accumulated related to the field of sustainability more specifically. Um, Refocus itself is a nonprofit cooperative, and flip to the first slide, um, that enables organizations to perform better by smartly addressing sustainability. So we have a unique methodology and training program that is designed to help professionals generate transformational change and to establish sustainability as a strategic priority. Okay, so we're gonna go through three quick sections, oh, relatively quick sections. One on the sustainability movement, we'll talk a little bit about Refocus itself and then our progress and some of the results we've generated. Um, so there's, there's a, a reality that I believe is emerging in this space. Um, I, I would hope that we can all agree, while sustainability efforts have led to a lot of progress over the past decade or two maybe, the reality is that we haven't actually advanced very far, nor are we even near on track to meet our climate change goals. Um, from Refocus's perspective, I think I can say conventional management perspective and the performance management practices uh, of today fail to address the complexity of our rapidly changing world. Said another way, very simply, the financial statements of today don't really give us the whole picture. Um, very simply, applying a sustainability lens to the management of an organization offers a more complete and sophisticated view of um, essentially everything that contributes to the success and resiliency of an organization as well as opportunities to significantly improve the performance. Um, we believe that a foundational commitment to functioning sustain sustainably has the potential to significantly strengthen the bottom line. The challenge is that demonstrating this potential that sustainability has, that many of us believe it has, isn't really possible without deep change to everything from planning to decision-making systems, processes, culture, et cetera. Ultimately, it requires organizational transformation. So uh, there's a couple of challenges that I wanna speak about. Firstly, from an organizational perspective, I think it's common for executive leaders to treat the sustainability agenda as a burden, uh, perhaps a regulatory imperative, or in the best case, a potential source of limited return. Rarely is pursuing sustainability seen as a means for significantly bolstering a company's performance or how well they do over time. And as such, most practitioners that are empowered to lead a sustainability program on behalf of their organization end up having little influence. Uh, they're supported with minimal resources uh, and they really struggle to develop meaningful progress. There's also a different kind of challenge that I see from the practitioner's perspective. Um, I'd say it's evident that most sustainability practitioners tend to focus narrowly on incrementally improving performance across sustainability indicators. Um, professionals in the space don't often fully recognize that making meaningful strides towards sustainability requires the sort of transformational change that we're talking about. And while they have strong sustainability subject matter expertise, they often lack much of the knowledge, skills, tools, and experience they would need to generate transformational change or the kind of systems innovation that's needed to enable an organization to evolve over time. This is something a little bit different and new that I haven't shared with the group in the past, so I'm, I'm very curious to get your feedback. Um, I put together this very basic equation, and what it suggests is that an organization's progress towards sustainability is basically a function of the resources they invest and the quality of the projects that are adopted. So with this equation in mind, I'd argue that we generally pursue sustainability quite irrationally, and as such, we limit our progress. So if you'll allow me for a second, if the objective is for us to sincerely and quickly progress towards sustainability, I believe there's really only two objectives a program should be anchored to. Before I continue though, does this equation make sense in principle, this idea that we've got a certain amount of fixed resources, 
we get to choose how we invest them. And the idea is the quality of those choices, those investments we make decide how fast we progress. Yeah, it may, I think it makes sense. I, I must admit, though, the math geek in me wants to see an exponent in there. <laughs> there isn't a math geek in me. So Come on, how, it's got to be exponential, maybe. <laughs> then we'll uh, have to sit down and work on that the next, uh, the next time. Um, it sounds interesting enough that I might take you up on uh, a conversation about an exponent in there. How about the, you two, Anthony or Henrietta? I mean, is it simple enough? Is it straightforward? Do you get it? Um, yes, I'm, I'm not sure you need to, uh, I understand why you put the word limited there, um, but, uh, but I think it's, it's, you can just say it's, it's the quantity of resources. And in fact, it's the quantity and the quality of the resources invested. So if you put your best people on it, uh, if you invest a reasonable amount of, of money, of course, these are all things that are limited in an organization. You don't have a, an infinite supply of them. Uh, which is why I understood you put the word limited there, but uh, yeah, no, that that uh, that that makes a, a a lot of sense. You you might even want to, as you noted in your earlier remarks, um, of course, sustainability uh, is one is one part of the end goal, but as you said, it should improve financial performance and performance in all kinds of other ways as well. Uh, so. Maybe maybe a few thoughts on that uh, might be useful. But yes, the math makes a lot of sense to me. Thanks. That's perfect, Anthony. Thank you. Henrietta, anything to add? You're on mute, Henrietta. There you go. Yeah. There we go. No, I don't have anything smart to say. I'm just... Uh, just do, 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 we, do we need... Um, do we need a, a formula like this? I'm, uh, I'm in doubt. Um, I, yeah, cool thing if it's possible. I'm not sure if I think it's possible. I'm more of a creative person, you know, so I'm thinking more in, uh, in terms of how to create things. But yeah, I'm not, I, need, I, need, I need to think more. I, I need to, uh, to get it more before I have anything smart to say to it. So but, right. but I like the idea, though, if it's possible to do this. Yeah, really the point of the equation is just to demonstrate a point. I, I want to make sure that the equation is straightforward enough that no one's misinterpreting it. Mm. And I think for the most part, we've got it. So um, I, here's where I'm going. So as I mentioned, I think if the objective of any sustainability practitioner, someone who's fundamentally committed to making their organization as sustainable as they can through the program that they lead, if their objective is to sincerely and quickly progress towards sustainability at a maximum, from my perspective, there's only two objectives that this program should be anchored to. So one, they should be selecting the projects that maximize how much we improve the sustainability of the world economically, socially, and environmentally. Granted, we can't always measure all of the impacts that may be generated accurately or even at all. But in principle, that should be the goal. We take our limited resources and put them where they make the biggest difference. If we, if successfully executed with a fixed pool of resources, this would result in progress being maximized. So there's a second objective that's also critical from my perspective, and that's to maximize the bottom line benefits generated for the organization itself. So here's the thinking behind that. The ROI or the return uh, of a dollar invested into sustainability versus any other area of the organization will typically determine its relative importance to those who are allocating budget. So if we can demonstrably surpass levels of ROI being generated by other departments or areas of the organization, it's conceivable that more resources would be allocated towards sustainability efforts. So, with a, if more resources are being allocated to sustainability because it's generating a higher return, then progress should naturally accelerate. So the key at the end of the day for accelerating progress is to find a balance between maximizing the quality of the projects we invest in, i.e. You know, how much the limited dollars we have push us ahead towards sustainability and at the same time generate the highest possible ROI for the organization. This ultimately ensures the pool of resources continues to grow 
and that our path is as towards sustainability is as efficient as possible. This might all sound like ridiculously straightforward and unnecessary to discuss and define, but in reflecting on the reality of the sustainability movement, which is what I hope to do next, I hope you'll see the point in having gone through this. So, we'll skip this because we've kind of discussed it. I want to um, introduce you to, got that? We're good. To um, this visual that I've recently put together that sort of describes the current field of sustainability solutions or thinking, however you want to describe it. Could um, you just say what's, what's the third word? Because I can't tell on my screen. Yeah, I, I, I can't see. Uh, can I suggest you just go out of slideshow mode for a moment and restart it? There's, something, there's some corruption somewhere in, in the post. There we go. That's better. Whatever you just did very before. Try, try it now and see if that Performance. works. Performance. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yes, now it's fine. Okay, good. So I, I want to take a closer look at the field of what I like to call uh, meta-sustainability solutions. So these would be like the overarching frameworks and method, methods that are designed to define the approach that an organization most closely follows as part of their path towards sustainability. Um, at the core of most of these sort of popularized meta-solutions um, is usually some kind of uh, method or framework that's designed to help practitioners to manage the sustainability of their organization. Um, the value of such solutions delivered can be broken down into what I think are three nested layers. So the first layer is built on managing sustainability performance. So these types of solutions typically will define the sustainability indicators that need to be measured and managed. They'll clarify the results and outcomes that we must achieve to be sustainable. And often they'll provide a rating or a score based on performance across all of those indicators. And examples of these um, meta solutions that fall into the category of managing sustainability performance include the GRI, the Carbon Disclosure Project, uh, the Sustainability Development Goals, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, and I'm sure there are others that you might be familiar with as well. Now, some of the challenges associated with these tools are as follows. So most of them employ some sort of a prescriptive one-size-fits-all scoring or rating system that promotes progress and strong performance across a breadth of sustainability measures or indicators. So what contributes most to sustainability is usually very unique to each industry and to each organization. So these solutions are actually encouraging, focusing away from the actions that will have the greatest impact in the interest of organizations producing a better score or rating. So by encouraging focus on doing as well as possible across all measures of sustainability to get points, organizations fail to rationally or effectively maximize the benefits generated to the organization itself. So that simple equation we just put up there, which suggests we should do one of two things or balance the two things, that being make as much progress as possible with the resources we have and try and increase the case for providing more resources are actually being discouraged by these solutions that are probably the most popular and well adopted in the world. Um, further, um, the scoring methods that are employed are typically quite flexible and flexible enough that the scores between different organizations or even over years for the same organization cannot be meaningfully compared. So an outside person would have no reliable way of determining what to attribute a positive or negative change in sustainability performance to. This ultimately leads to organizations dedicating effort to manipulating the reported results rather than focusing on improving how sustainably they operate. And ultimately, undeserving organizations are wrongfully recognized and awarded, and those who are deserving don't stand out as much as they deserve to or at all, diminishing the value of developing a sustainable image. And that is how Nestle gets to be at the top of the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. <laughs> so I hope it's starting to make sense why the equation was maybe necessary as a, as a starting point. Because I, I just want to really make clear how irrational the space that we sit in is. I think it's important we call a spade a spade for a moment. So let's continue with the second layer. 
So, so Randy, what, one, one thing I was going to observe, in your verbal comments just now, you actually talked about the feedback loop between uh, when, when you do take the resources you have and you focus on projects that can meaningfully impact the organizational performance, yep. that, what that then does is it attracts more resources to do more high quality projects. There was a feedback loop you described verbally, but it's not in your formula. Um, and and I, I think that this, that, that is actually the, uh, uh, that, that's a very important point that you made verbally. Thank you. Yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense. And uh, worth exploring, Stephen? Well, no, I'm just, I was just gonna say, um, that property is called in the complexity language, um, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And it's actually, um, you can express that in an equation form that would allow you to continue with your equation. Can I bug you about that later? Yes, you can. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so the second layer. And, and then I, I have a question too. Maybe it's just because I, uh, my English isn't good enough. But when you say the quality, how do you define the quality in your equation? The quality of the projects? It, it's something that I struggle to, to define otherwise. So I'm curious if you might have a better word. Um, all I'm trying to say is that ultimately, the goal is to select the projects that have the greatest impact. So the quality of the choices, as in the ones that get us the furthest along, mm -hmm. all things yeah. equal. But, but isn't that the big discussion then? What, what, what are those goals? What are those terms? What are those, uh, um, how, how, how to, pro uh, how, what are the goals that we go for, right? Like how to determine what is better than another? Sure, yeah, there, there's definitely a question to ask. Um, mm. I guess what I'm suggesting is that we're not trying to answer that question. We're, basically submitted to a, submitting to prescriptive frameworks that really don't even try to answer that question. Yeah. So instead but, but, of attempting yeah. a rational answer that may be less than accurate, we're just defaulting to something that makes no sense mm. or little sense. And, and, then, and then Refocus has a way of addressing that. So don't worry, Henrietta, we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> but uh, it, it, this is the first time, Randy, I think I've heard you present this critique uh, in such a, uh, a strong way, so I'm, I'm keen to hear, the, hear more. Uh, I'm excited to, to continue. Thanks for the, uh, the anticipation. Um, so the second layer is focused around advancing management practices. So meta frameworks or meta solutions in this space tend to look beyond indic indicators. Uh, they may include, but look beyond them as well, and profile how a sustainable organization would look in an ideal state. So it may define the standards that must be met in relation to governance, management, and operations. Uh, they may also provide an assessment or diagnostic and or score based on proximity to those standards. And examples of these types of solutions would include the transformational company, series roadmap, B Corp assessment, S Corp. Um, and again, and, and sort of being a little more critical, while these advanced solutions help us to understand what a sustainable organization would look like in the ideal state, they provide little insight into how to actual, actually manage a transition toward an, a more ideal state. So said a different way, understanding what we need to do to be sustainable is not enabling unless we know how to make that possible while limited by the constraints we face today. So wonderful to get a picture of the ideal and have that defined clearly. But again, if, if we don't have any sort of a pathway or an understanding of how to overcome the barriers that we have today in terms of where sustainability programs fit within organizations, understanding that ideal state doesn't actually make a difference. Not meaningful anyway. So, so are you including things like 40, ISO 14,000 and 26,000 in, in this category of advancing management practices, Randy? I'm less familiar with the, the standard on how it works. Um, I would imagine it would probably fit best here because it's more of a management standard. But, um, yeah, not positive. Maybe something to discuss. Right, and 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 future fit would fit would go in here as well. I think. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. As 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 promoting a where the practice is is suggested to be ideal. And you know, from that perspective, let me add, there's nothing wrong with these solutions, right? They're helpful. They're useful. They're absolutely necessary. 
Right, right, right. The, the, the thing that I'm trying to draw attention to is how we're using them. You know, as practitioners, if we anchor our programs and all of our efforts to these solutions, which really are not designed to be what will take us from A to B, then we've ultimately immediately cut off our hands and limited what we might accomplish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we need to recognize what the challenge is that we're trying or what the, the problem is we're trying to solve as a starting point before we run ahead. If we're just running ahead, not really understanding the problem we're trying to solve, or at least the problem that's at the core of the issue, then you know, we've greatly limited our, our potential for making progress. And that's kind of what I'm trying to illuminate through this progression. And, and it, it's, it's really interesting, Randy. I, uh, this, this is, of course, exactly the problem that we've always had with things like ISO 9000 um, on the quality side of things. It, the point of becoming ISO 9000 um, be, became because it, the original intention was that it should be used as a way of um, continuously improving. Right. The how, in other words, the journey, as you've been saying. But in practice, it became simply. Uh, a, a criteria you had to jump over in certain sectors because customers or suppliers were demanding it. And so it lost its, uh, orig the original intention was lost, I think, largely. And, and I think if you talk to the folks at B Corp, uh, at B Lab, for example, uh, they, they would say, of course, they absolutely intend people not just to simply score 80 out of 200, but then to work on improving over time. Uh, but in fact, uh, and this is work, uh, I just did a little bit of this with the head of B-Lab Denmark uh, in Copenhagen uh, two weekends ago. Um, what we started to, were starting to realize is that the B Corp standard actually doesn't have any progression mechanism in it. Well, and I think there's often an argument that, you know, the competition makes it worthwhile. Like, even though the standard is, is universal and it's not necessarily customized to what would be most meaningful to each organization, it creates competition that spurs everyone forward. And I would agree, in principle, you know, these types of solutions have perhaps ignited the movement. They've gotten more organizations active, involved, being part of the community of organizations that are addressing sustainability. But we plateau. You know, we're at the limits of where we can get with incrementalism. And you know, these types of solutions being used as the overarching frameworks are going to produce nothing more than incrementalism, unless it's the organization itself that's stepping beyond uh, what they're being, what they're receiving by employing these utilities. So we're pretty much on the same page so far. Yes. Okay, very good. We're looking forward to exponentialism. <laughs> I'm not going to use that word. No matter how hard you try, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> it's not part of my vocabulary. So the third layer, surprise, surprise, enabling organizational transformation. So from my perspective, um, solutions in this category support developing a new mindset and redefining the organization's current relationship to sustainability. Um, these solutions would define how to develop and manage a program capable of generating transformational change over time. Uh, and before I go on, what I want to do is, is share the opening part of an exercise that is part of our Refocus Applied Certification Program. And it has everything to do with kind of reflecting on an organization's program mandate. So I'm interested to hear what you, what you take away from the following. So it goes without saying that most any sustainability program is designed to help an organization address its direct and indirect impact on the economy, society, and the environment. Beyond being the right thing to do, the leaders that decided to start a sustainability program have likely done so to generate some likely incremental value or benefit to the organization. This could look like a combination of saving money through operational efficiency, maintaining a positive image for being a responsible corporate citizen, or establishing a reputation as a leader and innovator. It could also be that the program is limited by the scope of what it's expected to address. Examples would include largely focus on reducing environmental impact alone or internal and direct sources of impact separate of the organization's interactions with the outside world. The important thing to acknowledge is that the value a program was established to deliver by leadership isn't likely critical to the organization's performance or expected to lead toward transformational change. So long as a program is mandated or expected to produce incremental improvement, 
a sustainability leader or a sustainability program leader will struggle to affect more systemic and foundational change that is needed to demonstrate sustainability's potential. So to create the possibility of sustainability becoming a true strategic priority, the organization's relationship to, to its sustainability program must be redefined. This means bringing leadership to rethink their defined function or functions of the program they put in place. Success is likely going to demand refocusing the direction of a sustainability program and the actions that are being adopted through it. So I'm curious here to know, what did you hear in the excerpt I just shared? And if there's anything in particular that resonates or stands out for you. Henrietta, do you want to go first or Stephen? <laughs> no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, the... It's a tricky question. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's, I, I mean, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking back to the uh, Deming Total Quality Management 14 points. Which, which basically starts by reminding management that they are responsible for the system. And so if management is not, if the leadership isn't willing to champion the, the, the system that everybody's working in and, and therefore the leadership of changing that system, nothing much is gonna happen. So that's what I'm hearing in, the, in your statement. You're reminding, people, reminding leaders of that uh, reality. So could I, could I shift that just very slightly? I think you're absolutely right in that, you know, it's, if the leaders don't buy in, if they're not fully committed, nothing meaningful is going to happen. But I guess what I'm trying to point to through the excerpt is that if I'm a sustainability leader responsible for a program that I'm leading on behalf of my organization, if my focus is not squarely set on affecting that system through the leadership. If I'm not trying to affect change at that level, first and foremost, there's almost no point. I mean, you're going to be able to continue to progress incrementally. You're never going to get into truly meaningful change. So ultimately, let's recognize the true underlying problem that there is to solve, which is affecting change within the system versus just making incremental progress across indicators. Yes, as part of affecting systemic change, we will need to make progress across indicators and demonstrate success and value creation. But the context for the program that we're trying to lead needs to be expanded and deepened from my perspective, based on a connection to that reality. So it's not like there's, a, there's this existential sort of, um, there's nothing I can do and we're kind of screwed type of attitude that I'm hoping you walk away with. It's more of a connection to the reality of the situation and the problem that we need to be hyper-focused on solving as part of our more field efforts. What I'm getting out of what you're saying, if I understand it correctly, is that we need a systemic change. And, and that's, that I, I, I totally agree. I mean, you agree on that, uh, Anthony? Yes, uh, um, and I see what Rand is getting at. Right? There's, a, there's a problem with a lot of transformational change in lots of different fields that Everybody says, uh, if the leaders don't do anything, nothing's, nothing's possible. And, and we have a lot of people who have been tasked in our medium and larger sized organizations with the, the job of, quote, sustainability. Um, and then as Randy's pointing out, most of the things that they do today are, are incremental and, and that's never going to lead to fundamental change. But if all you then say to them is, well, it's because your leaders haven't bought in, this is kind of a hopeless message. Hmm. Uh, and, and I think what you're saying, Randy, and correct me if I've, I've understood, uh, not understood, you, you're saying that we need to give, we, if we can equip the people who are not necessarily the senior leaders in the organization with an approach to drive their efforts towards transformational change, then 
once they start delivering noticeably different results, that, that will actually bring their leaders along. You, I couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly what I'm saying. Hmm. Stephen, do you have anything to add? Um, I do. I do. Does this involve exponential anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna it is. First, now I'm going to introduce a threshold theory. Okay. So here's the question. Suppose my organization runs 38 incremental change projects and cumulatively they cross that threshold and it is transformative. How do I know, how, how do I know when a project, when what is being judged an incremental change project isn't that tipping, isn't going to be that um, tipping point that actually gets me across the threshold that allows the system that I'm participating in to actually shift its level of identity and transform? How do I know? It's a good question. I, I guess the way that I would think about it or my, the way that I'd respond is I think when you're in the game of leading a program on behalf of an organization, I think there's generally like some clarity or feeling intuition around whether or not what you're doing is leading to something bigger or if it's just perpetuating a path of incrementalism. Mm -hmm. And you might be pointing to an exceptional case where it's so ambiguous that you really can't distinguish it and the person's confused. But I would argue in most cases, we're just not even trying to address the, system, the systemic change that is possible or we're not recognizing the gaps, the needs for new competencies, the subject matter that needs to be addressed as part of creating that more systemic change because it's hard and because there aren't already resources and solutions available. And so we just focus on what we can affect change around and there's limited possibility within it. So I would largely say that's, that's an exceptional situation and if that's the problem we have, I'm happy to shut up and, and, and defer to the person who's transforming through amazing amounts of incremental change to continue doing what they're doing. Yeah, I just, I, I, I'm with you. I'm with you for sure, because this, I mean, underlying the, the core topic that you're into, that we're into now is what is our theory of change? And um, I think the motivator is how can we accelerate our rate of change, which are, it's a legitimate motivator. Um, I'm just, I, I think I'm just being, um, I guess what I'm really doing is I'm declaring the fact that um, I don't have any criteria yet for being able to assess whether a given initiative is a transformation initiative or whether it's an incremental change initiative. Fair enough. And I guess in response to that, I, I wouldn't necessarily look to define any individual initiative as being transformational or incremental. I think it's, it's the totality of the effort mm -hmm. and the, the types of things that are being addressed and affected that determine whether or not they're transformational in nature or intended to right. be transformational versus incremental. Absolutely. I'm, I'm with you on that. Fantastic. Anything to add? Anyone else? So, so um, what I'm just looking at, the, again, the title of this slide is Current Field of Sustainability Solutions. And you gave lots of really good, interesting examples of number one and number two, do you, other than refocus itself, do you have any examples of number three? <laughs> Very good question. Um, I don't have a good example, but I would say, oh, I, I, I've got one, please. So Anthony, this, this, is, this comes from the business that we used to be in. Um, so for example, we played in the IT enabled business transformation space. And so, um, a large pension plan would claim that if you were changing the core pension administration systems, then they're, you're, they're, you're in the business of enabling that level of organizational transformation. And you are at the level of changing the way that the fundamental business processes would operate, but you're not changing the mission of the organization. You're not changing right. the right. it creates. You're not including more stakeholders. So the T word is being used, but it's not actually a change at the level of identity. It is simply right. a change at the level of operating process. Sure. I think specifically yeah. though, Anthony, correct me if I'm wrong, like the, the context that you applied is sustainability solutions, yes? You were wondering if there was a sustainability solution that I've identified, or no? 
Uh, yes, I was specific. I mean, I agree with Stephen's example in the generic, but I was thinking about in the sustainability space. So the and, one and I, I, sorry, go ahead. Yes. The one that I was going to mention is the embedding project. I think it has an intention of being transformational. Mm. I don't think it's at mm. all. Which one? The embedding project. Embedding? Yeah. Yeah, this, this is the one that's being tri triggered by the Network for Business Sustainability, Stephen. So, I, I mean, nothing against the project. I think they're the, maybe the only one that I've seen that's really sort of tapping into this yeah. idea of what is it to transform. And they've accumulated a lot of subject matter or what have you, but as a, yeah. as a model or a method, uh, a management system for encouraging transformational change, I don't see it being very practical or applicable. Um, so that's that's my answer. I don't I don't really see anything out there aside from refocus. And with that said, I mean part of what I wanted to mention and sort of reflecting on this chart with refocus in mind is that um, you know the intention was refocus was for refocus to sort of fill this gap in available knowledge and training. but refocus as it is um, and as it's evolved to is currently not the end all. It's simply um, an initial solution that is recontextualizing the sustainability challenge around transformational change being the goal. Um, and ultimately, it is trying to build a perspective on everything that needs to be managed and, um, and addressed in order to be successful. There's still a, a ton of ground, a ton of uh, development work, new aspects of the solution that need to be developed before refocus is truly capable of transforming organizations consistently, but that is the, uh, the sandbox we're playing. Yeah. So, so, so actually, it, it, maybe just from a clarity of, of uh, explanation, one and two are the current field of sustainability solutions, yes. and then three is actually the gap. Yes. And I, and I think you actually mentioned two aspects to the gap, which are really key. W one is that we have to, g given that, um, uh, Stephen, again, back to the IT world, I'm reflecting on how uh, the journey that we've been on from IT being, you know, perhaps a manager or director reporting to the CFO, yeah. all the way now to somebody in the C-suite uh, with uh, increasingly operational responsibility for the business processes of an organization, which are, of course are now uh, almost entirely dependent on the functioning of IT systems. Yep. Um, that journey is actually the same journey we're on with sustainability leaders uh, that they have been, you know, they're, they're currently fairly junior resources. They're not in the C-suite. They don't get consulted on important positions. Right. And, uh, and we, we know that they're on a journey to being in the C-suite. Um, and I think, Randy, what you're saying is that we need to recognize that they're on that journey and equip them to have as much, uh, what's the word you use, I think, uh, uh, capacity, capability, um, as possible to do the best job possible given organizational limitations in order to demonstrate to the C-suite that in fact they should be in the C-suite. Well, I mean, even consider situations where you have um, a really successful sustainability program. You know, CEO gets engaged, goes, this is fantastic. I re I'm very passionate about this. This is awesome. I actually want to make sure that you continue to get more resources. And I'm behind this and willing to use my arm every once in a while to, to push things forward. What if that CEO related to the sustainability program based on what actually needed to happen for it to be successful rather than the sort of um, presented goal which is real or, or approach or management system, which is really designed around incremental change. You know, they might actually buy into the idea that right, there is something right. systemic that needs to happen. Right. But again, like I said, we're, we're failing to do our own job, which is, you know, we're promoting, yeah. perpetuating uh, a very yeah. mental game. So just yeah, this, 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 this is exactly what differentiates uh, the, the people like Ray Anderson at Interface Floor is that they, they, they not only realize they had the big change of heart and then they actually ended up being their own leader of the sustainability efforts and it became integrated. Um, I, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to listen to the recent talk by Emmanuel Faber, the uh, CEO of Danone. Uh, I, I'll put the URL for the, the video. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a really, really interesting video because it, it seems to me that 
he has actually, um, in, a, in, a, in a sense, gone further than Paul Pullman at uh, Unilever um, and uh, seems to be going down a very, very interesting path. And I, I think um, uh, th this could be an interesting wake-up call in, in this exact space. Um, yeah, anyway, well, I, I'll, I won't say any more about that, but uh, inter interesting, interesting. Stephen, you want that? Okay, I, I want to make sure we can get through the presentation. The feedback and the conversation has been awesome so far, so thanks for all the input. Um, we'll move on to the next section, which is really just introducing a little more detail about the refocus solution. Um, so I'll very briefly get into some of the specifics, mostly for your benefit, Henrietta and anyone else who is listening in on the recording who hasn't been introduced previously. Um, so refocus was originally developed within Harborfront Center. Uh, for, if you don't know, Harborfront Center is an arts and culture charity based in Toronto's, um, the heart of Toronto's waterfront, puts on something like 4,000 events a year and attracts about 17 million people to their site. Uh, in 2008, Harborfront Center decided to launch an internal sustainability program. Uh, the CEO was kind of disappointed with industry best practice that he observed and believed there must be a better way to address sustainability, not knowing much himself. Um, and he, he committed to exploring with an interest in deeper and lasting change, something that was sincere. Um, and ultimately, we, we looked at trying to model uh, and share what we might learn with the community at large. Um, several founding partners uh, believed in this vision and jumped on side. You see a variety of them listed here. Um, so I ended up leading this project or this program at Harborfront Center as a consultant. Um, I started with essentially no budget or expertise. And as a team, we managed to build an intensive program. We undertook 40 plus projects with a value of over two and a half million dollars, significantly reduced the organization's operating costs over time to the tune of over $150,000 a year, which is great for a charitable organization. Um, ultimately, uh, and sorry, the, the 40 projects with that budget were all completed without an investment from Harborfront Center. Essentially, everything was built on the foundation of shared value and a lot of partnerships. Mm, cool. Ultimately, Harborfront Center didn't institutionalize sustainability or fully transform. I like to call the program a grand failure because while uh, our attempt to follow a transformational path, which I just had sort of going in my head based on my background, while that wasn't successful, it unlocked, just trying to follow it alone, unlocked an amazing potential. Um, so we used the, that experience to inform the development of a methodology aligning the anatomy of what I would call a transformational sustainability program. And the goal was to have others benefit from the method. Um, and in order to do so, or to allow that potential to come through, I decided to create Refocus as an initiative within Harborfront Center. Um, so the organizations uh, that you see listed above were, were pivotal in lending their expertise and capacity, helping to bring Refocus into reality. Um, in addition to many experts like members of the SSBMG who contributed their input, feedback, et cetera, to helping to bring Refocus to its sort of uh, minimum viable product that we launched back in 2015. Um, so this is, this representation here, this model is, is the Refocus Sustainability Program model. It's designed to map out the anatomy of a transformational program in very, very simple terms. It covers disciplines related to both to sustainability and organizational change, and provides some of the practical know-how needed to set up capabilities needed for and to operationalize transformational change. Thanks. Um, Randy, can you just uh, go out of slideshow mode and back in again? It's corrupted on the, if you look in the Mac mini, it's for some reason, we've got a hangover from a previous slide. There we go. That's better. <laughs> a hangover. <laughs> Whatever you just did there fixed. Uh, okay. Yes. A hangover indeed. Uh, might be a Mac PC issue. It might be. Um, I'm not going to get too much into the weeds here. Uh, I'll just mention that essentially what, what maybe makes refocus a little bit unique from a modeling perspective is that we look at, uh, a program is being composed of two distinct parts, one being a foundation, which is the program setup or development. Uh, this is kind of the underlying part of the program, that being various capacities that are needed for the work that we do to be successful, that being leadership, change management, and measurement capacity. Um, on top of that foundation, which is kind of the capacity of the program, we have a program management cycle. And this would be a series of cyclical or annualized steps that we take in line with the organization's natural sort of annual operating process so as to ensure the projects we adopt maximize the progress that we make and 
the benefits that we generate to the organization per the equation that we discussed earlier. Um, moving right along. And I, I, I think from our earlier conversations and, and Randy, I'm just wondering if you've got any updates from your experience on this. Yeah. Um, the, the, the key here is that it, it, it's a very nice uh, um, biological metaphor that's in this uh, <laughs> chart with the roots and the, and the petals sure. uh, of the flower. Um, but of course, in, in the biological sense, the roots have to grow before the petal can grow. Uh, but in fact, it's also the case that you can have a little bit of roots and already have at least a little bit of petals. Absolutely. Um, and, and so it, it, it's not like you have to do everything in the bottom before you do anything at the top. In fact, quite the opposite. It's an iterative process. Absolutely. Very much. Um, that's not expressed so well just based on the simplicity of the visual itself. That's very much the case. It's not like you build a foundation like you would a, the foundation of a house and then build yeah. it. It's more like the roots are strengthened over time, you know, alongside the results above being the petals, the, the fruits being generated, improving and expanding over time as well. Um, so while it, it, might, it might be, uh, if, if it might be worth Randy just actually almost having one of those you know, biological charts of, of the, or, or graphics of the plant growing. Oh, that's great. And, you know, yeah. Because uh, it hadn't occurred to me until just now that that biological model actually does work for the continuous improvement process that is at the heart of implementing refocus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it occurs to me that that message that you were giving about providing hope to the sustainability leader, um, you could actually put almost some milestones in that journey. So when the that when the plant is fully flowering, um, is fully mature, then you might actually put sustainability becomes a critical function in, in, in all the members of the C-suite. Right. As, as one of the ways that you could tell that the flower was fully mature. I love the thought, it's very, very cool. Very cool, thanks for the contribution. Um, so to reflect on what we discussed earlier, while adopting projects and tracking results is essential, I think refo the re refocus model suggests that assessing how well a sustainability program is, has been set up and is being managed provides a more reliable measure of progress and adaptability than typical sustainability metrics do on their own without context. Um, so ultimately refocus is helping practitioners to assess how well every aspect of their sustainability program has been developed and is performing regardless of how sustainably their organizationally their organizational is currently performing so as such it's it's valuable to organizations with a program at any stage of development um, further one of the one of the interesting aspects of refocus is that it, it stands out as an all-encompassing framework i don't believe refocus competes with the hundreds of sustainability solutions that are out there um, ultimately it's designed to be complementary by enabling professionals to more confidently distinguish the specific utility of any given solution, how to select amongst them, and how to use several in combination to create all of the capacities that we need to be successful. This includes bringing to light the many competencies and solutions that don't typically land on the radar of sustainability program leaders in the first place. Um, so here I talk a little bit about uh, our professional training program model. So it's, it's broken down into three major components. Um, everyone who experiences refocus, is, refocus starts with our professional certification workshop. This is a day long session um, that familiarizes participants with the basics of our methodology, uh, the inspiring Harborfront Center story, and concludes with a self assessment. So the goal is by the end of the day, they can actually take a, a look at their own program and their own organization and come up with a decent idea of where their strengths and weaknesses are and what they might go to work on as part of working toward transformational change. Uh, the second component, once that workshop is complete, uh, our practitioners given access to a guidebook and an e-library of resources. Um, so this is an online platform. Um, our guidebook is interactive and growing. Um, and within it, we reference literally hundreds of resources from all over the world across disciplines that essentially allow practitioners to either deepen their knowledge or to access tools and utilities they may help them to apply the knowledge that we supply. Um, finally, the, the third component, which we've more recently developed, is the Refocus Applied Certification Program. This is a year-long process led by organizations we partner with, I'll speak more about that shortly, that's repeated annually to help participants work toward developing a transformational program by applying Refocus over time.
Um, while not applicable to everyone, Refocus is designed to meet the needs of a whole range of organizations and professionals. Um, we like to say that it, it's typically best suited to organizations with more than 25 employees, so either really large, small organizations or medium and large size organizations for sure. Um, it's certainly agnostic to sector, so it doesn't matter if it's private, public, or nonprofit. Um, the, the, because it's a model for change, it applies universally. Um, and ideally, it's for professionals responsible for addressing the sustainability of their organization, especially those leading a program. Uh, but it could also be valuable to academic students, consultants, and other sustainability industry professionals. So now onto the good stuff. What I hope is the good stuff, anyway. Uh, progress and results. So really quickly, um, since 2004, we've delivered educational programming to nearly, a, now it's over a thousand students and professionals through a variety of academic institutions, conferences, and NGOs, many of which you see listed here. Um, in 2015, May, we launched a, a pilot program to test our day-long certification program workshop and our learning platform as well. We ended up completing about five workshops with seven partners and reached and certified over 100 participants. 100% um, of those participants surveyed said they'd use Refocus in the future and recommend it to others. Um, but as much as they were really thrilled by their experience and the insight they gained, we felt and got the feedback that they needed something more, something more hands-on and applicable. So in November of 2015, we launched a pilot designed to test a year-long applied certification program. And this program was designed to help us establish a proven methodology for effectively applying Refocus uh, to demonstrate the unique impact Refocus can have when fully applied and to sort of template uh, an annualized process that our partners could use to help the organizations they serve and educate to lead them through change. Uh, so the organizations you see listed here participated in that year long pilot. Um, and all of them were very positive about their experience and what they took away. The reality though is that there's, as I mentioned before, there's lots more for us to develop and improve as we continue to experience both the challenges and successes that organizations face as they get into the material and try and deal with it within their organization and within the context that exists around their sustainability program. Um, so while someone uh, may find that the methodology is easy to understand and empowering, it doesn't mean that they can effectively apply it within a, any situation just because they've understood it. And this is where sort of refocus training in its current state is somewhat limited. So moving along. Um, um, Randy, if, I don't know if you have time, but it, could you get a, um, a, a, of those organizations on the previous slide, um, the, the one that I'm interested in hearing, uh, if you've got any specific stories, uh, is Sustainable Waterloo Region, because they work with small and medium enterprises, uh, that, that's their clients. Uh, their mission is to help those clients uh, improve their sustainability. Do you have any stories that you can share from the experiences you had working through Sustainable Waterloo Region with their small and medium businesses? Yes, so thank you. Uh, what I didn't distinguish is that the, the five organizations as in um, corporate entities, in addition to the city of Waterloo, um, we're all participants. Sustainable Waterloo Region was an observer. Sustainable Waterloo mm -hmm. Region is now interested in bringing refocus to its members, and I'll talk about that more just as we get into the next couple of okay. months. Okay. okay. Yeah, perfect. Really Thank you. Process with a keen interest in bringing refocus to their audience as well. And, and Sustainable Waterloo Region is, is one of the members of the Climate Collab, correct? Sustainability Collab, yes. No, no Sustainability Collab, sorry, yes. The climate yeah. is out of MIT, just to clarify. Yeah, okay, perfect. So, um, Refocus was really founded on an altruistic commitment to buy, that came within Harborfront Center to impacting as many organizations as possible rather than just maximizing profits or however we might benefit from sharing information that would be of value. Um, we had this minimum viable product that, based on our experience, had great potential to be improved and expanded. And as a result, we decided to splinter Refocus from Harborfront Center as part of pursuing its greater potential. So we've established Refocus as uh, an efficiently designed nonprofit cooperative. Um, essentially, the recognition was that there are dozens of NGOs globally that are dedicated to delivering sustainability-focused education and training 
to audiences of sustainability leaders or sustainability program leaders. Um, and you know, they, those organizations tend to be more focused on incremental program or incremental performance management type solutions and program delivery, much like what we discussed earlier in the, the, the very center of the, the nested layers that we looked at around meta sustainability solutions. And they're very rarely making the kind of meaningful difference that they're committed to. So rather than promoting refocus to leaders of organizations individually, we decided by building a cooperative, we could build partnerships with these NGOs who could then license refocus and deliver it to all of their members. This sort of approach or delivery model would allow us to efficiently reach a community of committed, committed, committedly engaged professionals that they served very quickly, minimizing the cost of marketing and the associated risk. Um, the cost efficient delivery model also allows us to sustainably offer refocus to professionals at a small fraction of its market value. Um, so each NGO typically has their own programming content, teaching model and method for engaging and enabling participants and few of them collaborate. Um, the cool thing is that being positioned as this provider of a solution or a utility to many NGOs um, creates a collective impact potential. What I mean by that is that the learning experiences that are accrued by all of the NGOs and the members they serve that are working with us will be used to advance the refocus solution, that being expanded, improve it, make it easier to use, etc. So without directly collaborating with all of the other NGOs in the space, the NGOs who are using refocus stand to benefit from the collective learning that everyone does which is a rather unique utility. Generally speaking, these NGOs are competing with one another, trying to innovate in the same ways, at the same time, using the same funding. This creates an opportunity for them to generate some, some shared benefit from what they learn. Um, and for, from our perspective, rather than, um, actually, if I can stop a moment, let me break down the, the components of the, the cooperative that I haven't really touched on that are in this slide. So the cooperative is made up of three arms. The, the one that I've been speaking about is our educational arm where we're working directly with NGOs and providing them with the solution. The second arm is academically oriented. And in this area, we wanna be developing advanced curriculum and participating in applied research that helps us to continue to better understand the challenges that are holding back organizational sustainability as well as substantiating the progress that we are making, what is working. And the last arm is around consulting. So basically delivering advisory services to the organizations that are using Refocus um, through a partner or otherwise. And we're also open at this stage to the possibility of creating a second membership class, which would be consultancies themselves who want to employ our solution as part of the services that they deliver to clients. So ultimately, rather than just becoming another consultancy with a proprietary methodology, we see this cooperative delivery model as, as unique in itself uh, and in itself and how it's designed more, a more sustainable model. The hope being that the goodwill we create by reaching um, and enabling many organizations on a cost recovery basis will organically and naturally lead to more lucrative consulting engagements and advisory type relationships. Anthony, are you on mute? <laughs> yes, I was, thank you. Um, so, uh, who, who were the founding members of the cooperative? Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> Will I continue? <laughs> yes, I, 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 apparently I'm your straight man this evening. <laughs> you just keep setting them up and uh, I'll try to keep them <laughs> well, I have one question on, on the previous slide. Do, 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 you work, do you work across? It's like these things are sliced, sliced up, like you're saying. Yeah, it's a great question. It's all about cooperating and, and, and connecting the dots in these different areas to have people cooperate. That's a systemic change. Of course, of course. Yeah, that, this is just a demonstration. It's basically just suggesting that we're trying to service or, or have a presence in three different domains mm -hmm. you know, that, are very, that require a very different representation of refocus. So in the case of working with NGOs, you know, we're providing this platform and a programming model. In the case of academics, we're building curriculum and working on research projects. In the case of consulting, we're working hand in hand with organizations, going into organizations and helping them to move ahead. Of course, um, the development work happening in all of these domains can overlap, can interact much stronger by sort of 
building but then up. I, then I'm really curious, what kind of venues do you, at what kind of venues or platforms do you bring the, the different areas together? Well, so this is, this is a matter of intention right now. Okay. Still, essentially, there's a little bit, a tiny bit of consulting work happening where I'm about to get into the updates, but the academic space is something that we're just entering into in a more formal way. And we've essentially developed a number of founding members on the educational side. So mm -hmm. Focus just became a cooperative at the start of 2017, splintering from Harborfront Center. I see. Kind of the intended model that we're hoping to build toward. Sorry for not making that more clear. So I'm mm -hmm. glad you brought that up. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and Randy, it, it occurs, from Henrietta's question, it occurs to me that um, what, one of the interesting things about cooperative business models is that um, the definition of who is us um, it becomes very interesting because uh, the way you the way this slide is written right now uh, this is talking about what the, the what the le the legal entity the cooperative is doing right the delivery of advisory services the working with academic institutions but of course you could also phrase this in terms of the benefit that the members who are actually doing this work are actually getting the value proposition to the members. Absolutely. So you can business modeling term, terminology. And um, if, if this is intended to attract more members, uh, it might be more interesting to, to phrase this in using those terms rather than from the organizational view. Of course, yeah, this is not the pitch presentation by any stretch. <laughs> You're absolutely right. The value proposition is not expressed here. This is more just like a little, a little uh, insight into kind of our the, the development right. design that we we hope to work toward. Mm -hmm. Right. But 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 I ha but I have to say, Randy, with my with my better my business consulting hat on my head, with a with a prospective client in in Norway and perhaps elsewhere, uh, this is a pitch presentation. Sure. Sure. <laughs> absolutely. And, and uh, I, I know there are many other members of, of the SSBMG who are offering consulting services uh, who, who could quite possibly deliver. Um, the, the other thing I just wanted to observe is this is almost exactly the same business uh, design that we have for Lean for Flourishing, except in this case, our, our target for our members are people encouraging startup activity rather than those people trying to encourage existing organizations to transform. So from a business model validation perspective, when you find other people adopting the same business model that you've already done, this is actually a very useful, uh, albeit small piece of evidence that you're, you're on the right track. Well, it doesn't hurt that we talk regularly. We've talked for <laughs> the last five years, right? It's this entirely self-confirming, Anthony. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> but earth my bubble, why don't you? <laughs> it's great. So um, this is sort of the last piece I'll touch on before I open it up to questions or what have you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, based on where we are today, we wanted to go to market and start to attract or work with, let me rephrase. Our goal was to begin on this NGO side of things. We have this solution, we have a programming or training model, and we wanted to work with NGOs to start to bring this to many organizations. So we set the goal of trying to establish a founding membership with three to four NGOs who would be willing and committed to pilot bringing refocus to a group of their committed members and working with us to deliver all of the related training. And the goal was twofold. One, of course, they would get the benefit of bringing this innovation to their audience without having to do any of the work to create it. Um, and it would all be done on a cost recovery basis. So they wouldn't be taking a, a huge upfront risk but the intention was that it was going to be a learning opportunity for both of us. So this would help us to understand maybe what's lacking or not as strong as it should be as part of going to market with the solution that we have. And it would also provide us with some good insight that we could jointly de develop around how to design an attractive and viable membership model that could be flexible enough to attract NGOs of different sizes and shapes. Um, so on the basis of that sort of context, we were able to secure four different founding partners, possibly a fifth, which I'll mention. Um, and I'll go through them quickly. Uh, the first is Climate Kick. Uh, Christophe, who was our speaker from Climate Kick last SSBMG meeting in October, um, connected with me through Anthony. Thanks again, Anthony. And 
we've talked a whole bunch. The interesting thing about Climate Kick is they've spent a lot of their energy over the past several years focused on building education and capacity around systems innovation. So they've largely ignored the subject, the specific subject matter and details of sustainability and focused on what it takes to create systemic change. Interestingly, when I came to them with refocus, there was this perfect meeting of here's all the stuff, all the, all the things that we need to train and develop in order to enable leaders who don't have power to create systemic change. And here's a model and a framework that deals with all the sustainability stuff that's necessary to manage as part of being a sustainability leader. And so we saw this fantastic opportunity to collaborate and so uh, they became a founding member and we're working towards delivering two pilot workshops, one in Brussels in December and one in Frankfurt in February, where we're gonna be educating their coaches and a group of their participants. Um, for your knowledge, the Climate Kick happens to function across Europe in 19 countries, uh, delivering training and education at all levels, whether it be from a student up to a startup, small business, medium-sized, multinational, academic institutions, et cetera. So they're pretty tapped into making a societal change. We saw the value, we've collaborated on developing this sort of pilot workshop that brings together um, our two strengths. And uh, there's an amazing potential for us to grow uh, and build on top of that. So our workshops are hoping, we're hoping our workshops help to demonstrate that there is a need and a perceived value in the path that we are going down such that, that Climate Kick would consider investing in the development of a much, much larger program and potentially using that program to contextualize and frame all their current educational offerings. So it looks like things are already in motion and there's a high degree of confidence in the potential the pilots have for demonstrating the potential that we have suggested is available. And yeah, I couldn't be more excited about where things might go. And for sure, we'll have some updates in 2018 on what's next for Climate Kick and Refocus. Um, I'll also mention, you know, part of Refocus's um, nature is that I and those involved are not fixed to it looking a certain way or evolving a certain way. Ultimately, the primary goal is to have the greatest impact possible. I know Climate Kick, as an example, is interested in expanding internationally. They've got deep pockets. There's absolutely possibility and potential for Refocus to, you know, be swallowed up and, and create, grown into something much bigger through Climate Kick or otherwise. But just sort of suggesting that the, the future trajectory path for Refocus is not fixed and is really about making a difference more than anything else at this stage. Um, second up is AISHI. Some of you might be familiar with the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. This is largely a, a United States centered organization. They have, I think, over 800 members, um, mostly in the US. All of the members are academic institutions. And uh, most of them participate in a measurement and reporting protocol called STARS, one of the most advanced that I've seen in the world. Um, I introduced Refocus to, uh, to them and presented at one of their conferences. They sort of drank the Kool Aid in, in, in agreeing that there needs to be a, a deeper change that's affected beyond sort of measurement, reporting, and scoring in, in, a, in a prescriptive framework. And they're essentially willing to pilot and bringing together a group of their members to test out refocus, go through the process of trying to apply it and seeing how much that makes a difference or doesn't. So we're pretty excited about that and are likely to launch our, um, our uh, program next July at Laurier. The third I'll mention is Partners of Project Green. I think PPG is the largest such NGO in Canada anyway. Um, and you know, we spent quite a bit of time developing a relationship over the last three or four years. Eventually they got excited about Refocus and its potential for innovation into their organization. This past June, we ended up jointly applying for about two thirds of a million dollars through the Ontario Trillium Foundation. And that funding was designed to help bring Refocus into its sort of 2.0 state and to deliver uh, a dedicated two year program to 45 of their current organizational members. Uh, we find out about that uh, grant at sometime in December and are hopeful that it works out and if not, still likely to go ahead with some kind of partnership. So the final one is Sustainable Kingston. Um, they more recently came on board. We're just in the process of exploring and launching a pilot. They're also interested in um, pursuing some trillion funding as part of the pilot. And uh, what I wanted to mention about Sustainable Water of the Region is along Along with Sustainable Kingston, Sustainable Water of the Region, and 
the sustainability collab have confirmed they'd be interested in, in participating in a collaborative Ontario Trillium Foundation application if Sustainable Kingston would go ahead as a lead applicant in pursuing a grow grant that would allow both Sustainable Kingston and Sustainable Water Region, as well as potentially other collab members to apply or launch a refocus pilot. Um, the last opportunity I'll mention very quickly is related to, okay, you, where we sit today. Um, we've been in talks, Stephen and I actually, over the last several months um, around the development of uh, an executive education program. There's a new edu executive education sort of school or program that's being launched um, in the new year and uh, having a sustainability component is of interest and the idea of refocus seems to align well to some of the other sort of aspects of the program and the fact that we're sort of market ready and somewhat proven uh, is also appealing to the organization. So we've been in, in the process of negotiating an MOU and, a, and, a, and agreement terms. We're not yet at the point where it's certain that the program will go forward, but we're hopeful that there is a refocus offering through OCAD Youth Executive Education Program in 2018. Um, so with that said, I mean, that, that highlights the majority of the sort of major developments that have come up recently around refocus, especially in the, the last year. Uh, but I do want to recognize that we're an SSBMG project and, um, you know, very much happy to share candidly and transparently about sort of our goals, what we're trying to do, our struggles, some of the things that we've experienced that might be of interest or useful for other projects or even others that are considering launching as SSBMG projects in the future. So I actually have a question for, for Stephen. Um, so is, uh, is your consulting company, Stephen, Transformation by Design, planning to be a member of the Refocus Cooperative on the consulting side? Yes. Um, and uh, I like the easy do you have any other? <laughs> All right, that's, uh, okay. And, and Randy, I assume that your consulting company is also becoming a member of the cooperative? Well, so to be, to be frank, the, the membership class dedicated to consultancies hasn't yet been established. I've been talking to a number of consultancies that aren't my own or Stevens to understand what their interests would be and what kind of relationship they might be open to as part of building a relationship. Um, it's not easy to conceive of exactly what could work universally or even in specific situations. So, um, talking to the Delphi group, talking to the Roots Collaborative, and just sort of seeing what they see in opportunity, around opportunity to use and leverage refocus and how they might be interested in engaging with us in some sort of a committed relationship that would be mutually beneficial. So right now it's more of an exploration than mm -hmm. uh, join and, and let's, let's solidify uh, terms in a deal. Okay, uh, I, I mean, I, as I said, um, the, the more that we're working on the services that better my business, uh, the, the con company that Harvey and myself and Panos are, are working on, uh, the, the more that we're recognizing that we're going to need certainly elements of refocus in our work and, and possibly all of refocus in our work. So I know that Panos and Harvey, uh, Panos is definitely coming to your training coming up uh, at U of T and uh, uh, I think Harvey's trying to come as well. Uh, so uh, I, 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 they know that we're that they're coming because they're interested. We're interested, so I, I would please add better my business to your your list of potentials there. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to always had it in mind, but good to know that it's it's an interest directly. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, we we have. To, I mean, you and I so far have just been dealing with the 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 initial opportunity that we have in Norway on a sort of as needed basis. Uh, but uh, we need to we need to think about how does that actually work in practice as we start to move that forward so I think just, just to elaborate on my answer Anthony um, when I think of uh, TBD joining uh, the consulting co-op um, I don't see it being done from the standpoint of being strategy consultants or business design consultants or even sustainability professionals I see, you know, my own personal view on the theory of change for this space is that it's actually a cultural intervention. And I think part of the problem that we have is that um, we treat sustainability professionals or sustainability program leaders as functional experts through our organizational lens. 
when in fact everybody in the organization should be embodying sustainability values as a core component of the culture of the organization. And so the moment you move towards functional specialization around sustainability, you actually, you actually are working against the larger transformation at the cultural level. So, so brilliantly said, and that's why you end up with someone who is an expert in operational efficiency or some other area, because functionally you can't have an expert that's good at every function of the organization that can apply the sustainability lens everywhere. Exactly. So that's, 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 that's the sort of angle of approach, if you will. Okay. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. So, yeah, I mean, I put a question out there about the project and if anyone had any questions, I mean, if there's questions, otherwise, anything else that, you know, sort of sparked you earlier in the presentation or that you wanted to ask, please, you know, anything goes. Do you, do you have um, a, a next level um, beneath the, the, the roots and the petals that's, that's easily shareable? As, as you know, I'm always keen on understanding the content as well as the, the organization and the development journey. I, uh, I may have just sent our mutual friend Javier from Climate Kick a reminder to start working on the visual for the <laughs> model we're creating, which is sort of, again, that melding together of everything we know about systems innovation and what we know about transformational change. So that will be the next level. I'm not sure what the visual looks like yet, but I'm pretty excited for the possibilities. Okay, okay. <laughs> if Javier is working on it, it will be good. <laughs> I'll, let him, I'll let him know there's a general vote of confidence in his favor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, perfect. Tell him we want okay. to see like built out of Lego. <laughs> He'll be more, <laughs> more excited, I'm sure. That's right. Um, Okay, well, I, I think we're at the end of our, uh, our allotted time pretty much. Uh, this has been a very exciting update, Randy. Thank you very much. Oh, cheers. Uh, and um, yeah, I can, I can see that there's going to be a, 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 lot, uh, a, a lot to do over the next, uh, the next little while, but all very, very exciting. And uh, a, a number of significant... Uh, intersection points that we, 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 we're going to need to explore. I can see that. So that's, that's, all, that's all good. It's all well, very can good. You, can we have you back in the flesh? Looking forward to catching up. And I really appreciate the encouraging words. It's, it's exciting to, to see all of the movement happening within the group. Absolutely. Henrietta, any closing thoughts or questions? No, just that, I mean, it's late here. <laughs> I'm tired, but I think it's really interesting. Um, different approaches from, from uh, kind of different from what I'm doing. So I'm trying to catch up with the, the way of you, the, the way that you guys think and work. It's a bit, um, I don't know the English words in Denmark. We have a Danish word is in a speech. It's a bit, it's a bit, a, it's like a, you, you know each other well. So, so I'm a bit, I'm an, I'm, I'm a bit of an out, outsider, right? So I have to uh, catch up with the way you're thinking and talking to be on, um, onto everything you're saying. Um, but I guess we have the same goal out there um, in the horizon. I think so. Yeah, it's a fair statement, Henrietta. We've, we've talked for many, many, many hours together over the last several years. So I guess there's, there's naturally a familiarity in how we speak and what we mean by what we say and all the rest. So I can appreciate that it must be a bit tiring trying to keep up especially as we get excited about each other's ideas and comments. No, I love that. I love that part. So, so, so no, no, no problem doing that, but I'll see that uh, I like to, to join next. And also, meanwhile, trying to catch up with uh, everything that you have said and see if I can get to know more of the work that you have done. Thank you for that. So, um, uh, Randy, please, please make sure that you share uh, details of, of what, what if, if, if there's any possibility for uh, the, the members of the SSBMG who are in Europe to attend those workshops that you're running with Climate Kick, uh, if, if that's a possibility, uh, or if there's some application process uh, so that Christoph can uh, assess uh, for those two workshops, maybe you can uh, get Christoph or yourself could post that to the LinkedIn group when the time comes so that people can uh, can, can sign up. When? And, uh, 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 
sorry. The one in Brussels will probably be closed because it's for the coaches, but mm. in uh, February, we'll be having one in Frankfurt. Okay, cool. Mm. Happy to post those details and just to confirm first that it's kosher that we invite others who they might not have invited directly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Exciting, exciting. February is lovely. I've, so I've heard. <laughs> can't, can't even wait. <laughs> <laughs> I sent you a postcard. Um, the, the, the other thing to Henrietta's comment that it, it's just uh, uh, prompting me is that, uh, uh, of course, coming from our IT transformational enabled change background, those approaches uh, while they had elements of design in them, were fairly analytic. They were fairly planning, uh, classic planning approaches, classic management uh, analytic approaches, not, not terribly synthetic, not terribly design orientated. And um, uh, of course, when we start to think about uh, what's necessary for transformational change and uh, foresight orientated techniques like backcasting um, mm -hmm. and and how those techniques fit into a into a proven transformational program design and management approach uh, th this is an interesting topic and I, I don't know if you've started to think about that being something to explore in version two but uh, could be interesting yeah I think the big difference is just when you have when we look at IT enabled transformational change, those are programs where the organization's leadership decided that transformation was necessary. There was necessity. So you didn't have to worry about the systems innovation component. You just laid out the transformational pathway, right? Like mm -hmm. yeah. you could do in action in order for the organization to go from as a state A to to B state B. So it's just a different scenario and a much easier one to deal with, of course. We can hope that one day sustainability becomes necessity, but we don't want to wait for it. Yeah, absolutely. And with those inspiring words, uh, why don't we close at this point? Stephen, if you'd like to end the recording, and uh, then when I end the meeting, it should start to process on your side. Thanks so much, Anthony. Thanks, Henrietta. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. See you some other time. For sure. Take good care. Bye-bye, Henrietta. Bye-bye. Um, and hang on, let me see where am I go. Oh, Anthony, I'm having difficulty finding the uh, end recording. Uh, it, sh it should be down in the bottom of the window next to the share screen chat button. I think you just click that button. It should be red at the moment. If you click it again, it should turn off. Um, hang on. Okay. In the wrong. Oh, there we go. There we go. Where is? Oh, oh, oh. What's this? Hide thumbnail video. Small. Show thumbnail video. Show large active speaker video. No. Stop video. No. That's not it. Sorry, Steve. It should be down at the bottom of the screen, uh, Stephen. Not Skype. Hang on. Yeah, well, I'm trying to get there. Hang on. Um, let me just expand this. Go ahead, Randy. You can take off. Uh, yeah. Hang on. Hang on, Anthony. Okay, screen sharing has stopped. Okay, now I can pause the recording.